she with you? I thought she was with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of Holding Court with the Nerd Queens featuring Snyder's Amazons. I'm Cole. I'm Nana. And tonight we have Meg. Hey, what's up? Danny. Hi, everyone. Kat. Hi, guys. And us. (laughs) (laughs) And today we're going to be discussing Sucker Punch. Yes. So let's let's start off well I mean with the general how did you guys feel when you first saw Sucker Punch uh, what was your first impression of it when did you actually get to see it like did you see it in the cinemas or did you come across it accidentally did you know about Zack Snyder and his work before that let's start with it Well I came across it because um yeah, Henry Cavill was at the premiere with Zack Snyder, and you know I, I, I've always kept track of Henry Cavill no matter what, wherever he is. So. Um, and uh, I didn't get to see it in the theaters, but I did get to see it like when it came out afterwards. And uh, my first impression of it was, um, in a way, empowering because it's about a female who's, you know, trying to fight against her abuser or abusers. So I would say empowering is my first impression. Okay. Yeah, I I agree with Kat. I definitely feel empowered when I first saw the movie. It was cool to see like all these female characters like fighting for their own freedom uh, from their abuse and their abusers. Um, I don't really remember when I first saw it. I, I know I had a, one of my brother's friends was like shitting on the movie really bad. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch it. And it was the first Zack Snyder movie I saw after um, I saw 300 and I loved it. So. Okay, Danny. Hi. Uh, well, to me, it was uh, an accident, really. Uh, at the time, uh, I had no idea who Zack Snyder was. So it, I had to recognize for me, um, it was hard at first to really uh, grab the movie. Uh, There was so much symbolism, so much, I don't know, layers that should be understood. Uh, The first time I saw it, I um, one thing and one idea, and the second time, so. It's like a new uh, significance comes uh, at surface. So uh, for me, it's every time a new challenge for me, really. But the visuals to me were, uh, I don't know, were addictive, really. Beautiful, all of them. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying with the layers, because I think I think that's honestly what's really great about Zach's work in general, that even years later, after re-watching a film a thousand times, you can still pick apart certain little things that you didn't notice before. But yeah. um, I came to Sucker Punch by sort of an accident, and I don't think I... When I first saw it, I don't think I even connected it with Zach. I don't think really that I've seen it like as in, oh, this is Zach's work and I want to see it. I think it was more like, oh, hey, look, this film looks interesting, so I'm going to watch it. Um, But the reason I asked you guys, I mean, obviously I really liked the film, but the reason I asked you guys was because um, when I was obviously preparing for this episode and I was looking back at certain things... Um, I noticed that a lot of people, when they saw the film back in the day, uh, they saw it as something completely opposite than I did. That uh, yeah. for a lot of people, it was like, this this is the example of misogyny and all this kind of stuff. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, no, that doesn't feel that way. And in the first the first time I've seen it was obviously when I was back in Czech and yeah. I didn't really have that many friends around me who'd watch these kind of films. So I was a bit closed off from the general public opinion of this film. 
So, obviously, what we started and built this podcast on was the discussion about feminism in Zach's films. And I think that Sucker Punch is one of the best examples of yes. feminism in Zach's films. And um, so I'd like to kind of dive straight into this, you know. If you compare the general public opinion, or at least, you know, the opinions of these people who claim it's misogynistic and all this kind of stuff, what would you say? Like, what did you, what did you, when did you first see the feminism in the film and how do you actually perceive it yourselves? What stuck out to you? You know, this kind of stuff. I mean, I don't see any misogyny in it at all. Um, it's basically a film about females who take initiative and take control and try to get out of the situation that they're in. Um, from the beginning, uh, when Baby Doll is trying to save her sister, you can tell that you know she's empowered to get out of the situation that she's in against a male. So I don't know where these critics are saying that it is misogynistic film, but it's not. You know, I don't, I don't see it that way. And I don't understand why critics see it that way when it's clearly. Yeah, me either. I feel the same. Females I mean, who are standing up. Uh, it's like this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I feel like I don't really understand where they get the misogyny part from, because if anything, it shows that these women are outsmarting their abusers in the situation. Um, one of the first scenes uh, that really stuck out to me was uh, Dr. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Gorski. Yeah, I believe so. Vera um, Gorski. Yeah. When she's um, telling baby doll that, you know, she needs to dance. Uh, you have all the weapons you need now fight. Um, I, I love that scene. And I, I just don't understand the misogyny because they're, the situation where they're getting all of the uh, the five elements that they need for their escape, it's like all of the situations involve men being distracted by a pretty chick. Well, so I, I, I don't know. That perfectly highlights a problem within society that for some bizarre reason, society has a problem with women empowering themselves through their yes. bodies. And also other women have a problem with other women. Some women have trouble <clears throat> accepting a woman who can feel empowered through her sexuality or her body or her mm -hmm. or things like that. So the idea of being able to use your feminine wiles to distract a man to get stuff done it's like, oh, well, if she's doing that, it means her creator, the creator of this film must be a misogynist. And it's like, right. what? <laughs> Even though he's just highlighting that. Like, yeah, I've never understood why people think this is a misogynistic movie. I think I think the other part of this is, and you guys probably remember, because I've mentioned this in, in our past podcasts, I think that... Other problem with uh, the perception of misogyny in uh, Zach's films in general, but also in this film, is the idea that for someone to be feminist, they have to show the women on top all the time, which Sucker Punch in her it doesn't. Sucker Punch puts the women in a pretty much hopeless position where, mm -hmm. you know, that they're doesn't seem to be any escape there does not seem to be any way out and it's kind of hopeless in the sense that you get them you see them being treated sent to a mental institution all this stuff that's yeah. something that's been happening in the past it was real yes. back then yeah, like and the the thing about this is this is the feminism in reality of things you yeah. can't it doesn't make it any less feminist if you show women in the real situations as the situations have been or they are now. If you show the reality of how it is and yeah. then you show that the women can still deal with it in their own way. That is mm -hmm. that is ultimately feminism as well because yeah. at the end of the day it's not like I'm going to be walking out and I'm going to be a super soldier and that's the only way that I'll be empowered woman no 
I can do all these things that the girls in Sucker Punch could have done, you know, whether it's seducing men with how I look in order to get out of a certain situation or escape in my head, you know? Mm -hmm. These things are real because that's how things work in real life. That's how women fight things in real life. And I think that is something that people look down upon because... To, yeah. I think there is still the sick stigma that um, in order to be powerful, you need to fight like a man and yeah. not like a woman, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I also want to, like you hit on before, uh, like women long, well, not that long ago, actually, they used to be sent to mental hospitals when they were seen as, I don't know, acting out. And they were treated like they had a mental illness. They were given lobotomies to change their personalities. Like, this is all real things that happened. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah like in the 1950s and 40s, 50s. Yeah. That's when so, it takes place. Yeah. So it's, it's based off of yeah. the real life event. I think people just forget. Exactly. Yeah. I think that when things have a historical real world pre- uh, precedent, Especially in yeah. something like this. This is like... Basic- People just forget about human history sometimes. Exactly. They're very eager. In the in humanity as a whole, is very eager to forget these things. And when it comes to something like Sucker Punch, people aren't used to being confronted with something that was very real yeah. and makes them uncomfortable. When they see a film with a trailer where, like, these badass girls are fighting and yada yada, and it looks all flashy and cool, they don't expect it to be deep. They don't expect right. it to have any real world like meaning, yeah. but then when you sit down and if you actually like if you're awake like not like I feel like you'd have to be sleeping through the entire film <laughs> to miss like the yeah. real world relativity to it, and people just don't like to remember yeah, that. And add, yeah, and add to that the incredible pop culture references. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, there is sort of a mask for the real issue, which is uh, women standing up. So I think people just don't get the movie, really. No, they really yeah. don't. And it's that's basically something that Zach has had to struggle with with all of his films, is, when, is the fact that when he empowers women, he doesn't try to make them manly. He doesn't try to take away from their powerful sexuality or their femininity. And for some reason, people see that as him being misogynist and see him as objectifying these women when, in fact, he's giving them, he's basically saying, you should be proud of who you are and what you came into this world with. Right. He's not taking away their feminine identity to make them badass. They're badass and they're women at the same time. They're badass, uh, not, and also they're bad, they're not badass because they're women. Right. Exactly. Just, yeah. it's like you can you can see these women on the screen and you can think hey this is what I can be not this is what I want to be obviously that's what you want to be but this is also what I can be I can right. do this this is how I can fight because I know how to and basically what he shows is something that we can do we can see ourselves doing and it shows that it's okay to do it that way. It doesn't take away from who we are. And I think that's a really important message that not enough filmmakers make. Yeah, and there's, there's also this whole, like, stimulus of a well-behaved woman. Like, if you're speaking out or, show, or like, fighting back, it's somehow, like, it makes you less of a person. And in Sucker Punch, more than any of his other films, he's showing how you can take control of any situation, whether it be going into your mind to take control of the reality so you can survive it, or doing it in reality so that way you can get out of it. Yeah, and he shows women working together for their own freedom, which I feel like it doesn't happen a lot in movies. It's usually only one main female character. This one has numerous lead female characters. Yeah, and some of them are women of color, which is really yes. important to note as well. Like, 
you know, and it's not forced. It's not something that needed to be discussed over media for X how many months. Mm -hmm. It's something that's just there, which is another thing I really appreciate about Zach's work. It's natural. It's natural, yeah. and casts people no matter what their skin color is, what their, you know... What their religion, sexuality, etc. Gender, etc. Yeah. And I think that's really something that's so important about everything, about his yeah. work in general, because hang on, is that Danny? I think she's echoing. Danny, if you can hear us, you're having a very bad connection, honey. We can't hear you. And when we do, you sound like us, you're having a very bad we can't hear you. Yeah, I hear you terribly, guys, too. I don't know. Now we hear you. Okay, go on. Now we hear you, Danny. Can you hear us? Hello. Uh, Okay. Hello. Okay, what did you want to say? Better? What did you yes. want yeah. to say? Uh, yeah, I was uh, listening to you guys, yes. and yes. Uh, it, it's true, really. Um, uh, um, my recent watch of the film, I just confirmed everything you just said. Um, there was... Um, there's so many elements. Uh, people um, are used to much more simpler films. I think um, um, it's not uh, the movie's fault. I mean, uh, if you see a movie with uh, awesome fights, it's not necessarily it's about the fights. You have to be prepared and, and open, especially. Uh, the fanatics of the of the great uh, performance to me um, so many uh, layers and so many things to be discovered and the first time I saw it for example I thought it was about baby doll it was about uh, all the her perspective but the last time I saw it uh, I just to me, it was all about sweet pea uh, and a multi-layered world and her mind. Uh, so uh, it's understandable that it's hard to grasp, uh, especially with all those other elements uh, around, those uh, symbolism, the, um, uh, the awesome fights, the costume, which uh, I think it was one of the why people call the movie misogynist. Uh, I think the uh, the way the girls dressed uh, makes uh, people feel like I don't know. There, there's this uh, misconception of what a woman can or can't do because of the way she's dressed, and I think that's the whole point of the criticism. They don't see beyond that, and and that happens to women. We are judged. Every, in everyday, everyday basis, mm-hmm. because of the way we look, uh, the way we dress, uh, are we overweight? Are we too skinny? Are we too our hair? We are judged every day, and I think the movie received uh, a similar judgment, and that's why it's uh, kind of uh, difficult. Yeah, yeah that's I completely it. Yeah. agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah. me too. Very yeah. well said. I agree with you. May I, actually, uh, when me we go too. back to, Very well said. It, was it about Baby Doll or Sweet Pea? May I, <laughs> Cole and I had a discussion very recently about it, because obviously we were doing our rewatch in preparation for this podcast. So how was it with you girls? Did you immediately notice, obviously Denny just said, but did you guys immediately notice that it was... Sweet pea and not baby dolls, mind. Um, no, I didn't realize that until the end. But yeah. then, 
once I did realize at the end that it is Sweet Pea's story, I thought back to the beginning and how it starts off with the guardian angel quote. Um, yeah. That basically the guardian angel is... Did everyone know what's Siri and Echo? Yeah. Hang on, yeah. girl, girls. Yeah. Can everyone yeah. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you, but someone issue. has an Echo. Okay, just a moment. Hang on. Girls, we're going to take a real quick break. <laughs> Let me pause the show. Yeah. Hello, we are back from a trouble with connection with our uh, connection here. So previously on Snyder's Amazons, we were discussing the uh, who the movie was about about Sweet Pea or Baby Doll. Carry on, ladies. Commercial break over. Mm-hmm. Carry on. Um, <laughs> I was saying before that it's it seems like it's Baby Doll's movie, but really it's Sweet Doll's movie. Um, I mean, she's talking about Guardian Angel at the end. But also, when you go back and listen to the beginning, there's a, he, there's also a guardian angel quote, and I think Baby Doll is who the guardian angel is. Yeah, I was um, when I re- when I was rewatching the movie in preparation for this podcast, and I was writing down quotes. I wrote the opening monologue down, and I was le- and it, I found that by the end of the film, I totally see what you were saying that Sweet Pea was talking about baby doll in the beginning and that's why it's framed up the way it is where it shows how she ended up at the asylum how she got there with like how her story came to help theirs and it's baby dolls uh, i mean it's sweet pea's story through baby dolls actions story and mm-hmm. the world yeah definitely and you were speaking of Yeah, I didn't quotes. get that at first either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I got it at first, to be honest. I, I, I didn't did. get it until the very end. And then once, you know, I realized that it was, I went back to, okay, well, let me think about the beginning of the movie. And that's when it just hit me that the guardian angel is baby doll. And- mm-hmm. When we are at the quotes, did you guys pick any quote that you could think of that kind of stuck with you? Um, I said it earlier, but um, when the doctor is saying, you have all the weapons you need, now fight. I love that because it's like she didn't need anything extra. She had like everything she needed with her. Yeah, I do like that quote. Yeah, Uh, when she's telling her, like, you know, you don't want to be judged. You don't have to be, you Mm -hmm. know, everything is is up to you and how you interpret it as, you know. Yeah, the whole way, like, she spoke to her then, it was like the approach, you know, was, okay, you can stand here and do nothing and end up dead or you can fight Mm -hmm. the only way that you know how or like the only way that you have at the moment but yeah you do have every weapon that you might need I think that was like that was really inspirational in a sense that every situation even the most shitty situation that you might be facing there always or nearly always is a way out whether it's an actual way out or at least a way to escape in your own mind anything there is always a way to fight there's another quote that i really like i actually looked this this one it stuck with me you control this world let the pain go let the hurt go let the guilt go what you're imagining right now that world you control that place can be as real as any pain that's a yeah. quote that really, really stuck with me. It's, you know, you control your, how you take things at, and, as, and, you know, if you feel pain or you feel hurt, it's, you can't really expect the other person to, whoever hurt you or caused you pain to do anything about it. Sometimes you have to take it upon yourself and, you know, find whatever way you can to deal with it. Yeah, I agree. That's a good one. 
It's also the last um, quote from Sweet Pea at the end of the film, where it's so who's st- oh Casey. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she's awake. <laughs> she's awake. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> We have, she anger. Now now she's I wake up. <laughs> we have angered the little goddess. Anyway, so it's um, the ending quote of hers where she's just like, so whose story is this? I think that <laughs> kind of looking at it now that I rewatched it today for my notes and everything, I was thinking about it in a sense, like in one way, maybe the Sucker Punch story is not as much about Baby Doll or even Sweet Pea as it just kind of, with the last quote, it kind of says, it's whatever it is, it's your story and it's up to you. You are the hero of it. Yeah. And right I now really it's Kissy's story. Like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, Kissy, Kissy's writing her own story. Right she's now. she's really wanting to jump in on the podcast. She wants <laughs> it to be about her story. <laughs> no, she's quiet. No, but you're right. I agree that you know it's it could be anyone's story, and you know, as you watch the movie, you can relate to certain. You can almost <laughs> put yourself in their shoes and relate to certain things that have happened to them yeah. to your life. So it could be your own story as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I some people uh, some major criticism that comes from this film is that people didn't. Yeah. Un- some people didn't understand the fact that escapism. You're right. Is Kat. a very very real thing. I mean, for me. Dan. She's there. Hello? Danny started talking, so I started to be quiet. But I guess she's not there. But um, I was saying that escapism is a very real thing. Because yep. for me, um, when I was watching the film, I could very much relate to... Hello? The co- Hi, Danny. We can hear you now, kind yeah, of. Yeah, I'm but here. You're, but you're very, very delayed. <clears throat> the connection but um i could relate to the escapism aspect because especially in high school i have like the way i thought about it while watching the film was i yeah i have lived a well uh, i i was agreeing with what you said i mean uh, i think each one of the stories or each one of the fights Okay, we have. All right, we're back. Sorry for another audio issue, but we're jumping right back into it. So, as I was saying, I really heavily related with the fact that the characters were using escapism as a way to cope with their reality. And so, it like, so a lot of people criticized it because obviously there's not a lot of people who can relate that heavily to something like escapism because there's daydreaming mm-hmm. and there's like losing your train of thought but then there's actual escapism where you sit there and you just go inside your head and you lose time and I used that a lot when I was younger to cope with some of the more difficult parts of my life like I've literally like if you were to put down on paper every single time I've done that I have lived like thousands of lives inside of my head and I thought that was a very like a very raw and personal thing to see on screen and to see it done in a way where it looked as amazing as sometimes it felt like yeah. escaping into your mind cannot isn't always like just sitting there and staring at paint drying it's also experiencing things like i would put myself into books and comics and stuff and it looked a lot like sucker punch <laughs> <laughs> It, I view it as, you know, yeah, escapism, but I feel like she has a mental illness. And I, I mean, just from being a nurse, I feel like she has um, schizophrenia or a, um, like, a character dissociative identity disorder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how I view it as, just because of the way that she, um, 
the way that she puts herself in the situations. And I don't know if that's what Zach is trying to portray or not, but that's I think you know, it's my little, interpretation of it. I think it's a bit of both because he's showing her coping with trauma and the way that she's used doing it, escapism, like that's a textbook definite uh, way of coping with trauma is literally to disassociate and remove yourself from the situation. It doesn't imp- entirely mean you have disassociative personality disorder, but it's still it's dissociating, you know? It's removing yourself from the situation or putting yourself in a situation that you actually have control about. I think he was kind of leaning towards a more open-ended answer where it could be either or. And yeah. that's what makes the movie, you know, it's unique because everyone's interpretation of it is different. Different but correct. Like, there's really... Right. There's really no... There's wrong no wrong way. answer. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I do love how you hit on the escapism part because, I mean, I use movies and comics and whatever for my own escapism to maybe just drown out what's going out throughout the day or my own trauma that I have, um... And I feel like not a lot of movies show that escapism part very often or not to the level that he did. Yeah, like with the whole epic well. scenes. Yeah, not as well. Like there are scenes where she's like riding a dragon and shit. Like that's something that I would have like imagined in my head. Yeah, exactly. And like most Like you people- underestimate just how wild the imagination okay. Right. Yeah, and it's, exactly. uh, it's it's an aspect of depression, and like I just said, coping with trauma. And yeah. a lot of people, they get, when and filmmakers in general, or those who are trying to portray this, uh, the complex disease of a mental illness, they get stuck on like something with depression where they assume you're just sitting there staring at the wall, or you're crying, or you're broken, and it's like, mm-hmm. it's not always like that. Sometimes you literally just kind of, you check out, you escape into your mind, and you create a world that you can control, but also, like, a way to get... And also, it's a way to help you, like, sometimes think through your problems. And that's what I found in a lot of the scenes where she was dancing. That's what it felt like was going on. So, through the dancing scenes, she was coming up with solutions and enacting them. We were just seeing it in a different way. And that's, like, a very real and human thing to do. hmm And I do agree with that. However, the difference between, you know, you imagining that versus baby doll imagining that, I feel like she can't differentiate between what is real and what is not. And that's why I would, I see it as a schizophrenia, because they don't know the difference. Versus right. us, like, if we put ourselves into a situation, into imagination, whatever we do to cope, you know, whatever fantasy or whatever you know, place that you want to be in your head, you know that it's not real. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can differentiate between what's in your mind and what's going on in the real world while well, baby doll, she's having, you can tell that she doesn't know what what's real and what is not. And that's where, that's where I think the schizophrenia comes in, my interpretation of it. No, that makes a lot of sense, especially since um, you can tell near the end that She's so heavily engrossed in the fantasy world that um, she needs it to survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's unable, she's physically and emotionally not able to distinguish between the two. And that's, you know. I think that that could have been, I mean, not to deny that it's true or not. What I mean is it could have also been brought up by the severe trauma that she's been through. Yeah, that's the thing about mental illness is that almost every single kind of mental illness can be triggered by some cor- sort of trauma. So that's entirely possible. But when we speak of mental illness and when we speak of all this kind of stuff, and I mean, especially now, at the time when we were recording this, there is a big, big boom about another film, but mental illness issues obviously joker and Mm -hmm. i found this little thing which i obviously didn't think when i saw it the first time but today since i rewatched it and i've watched joker this weekend i had a similar feeling at certain points of the films which like there were scenes or 
basically portrayals of certain things that made me almost uncomfortable, but not in a way that, how would I describe it? Basically, it made me uncomfortable, but I know after watching it that it was supposed to make me uncomfortable because it was supposed to make me think about these things, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. What that's I found fine. out is that, especially Joker now, but I do believe Sucker Punch back then as well, get a lot of criticism for that. And I don't think it should. I think that the problem, and I've been talking about this with my friends, and I've been talking about this with Cole as well, and I might have mentioned it to you girls too. I think a lot of people don't really grasp the fact that there are certain parts of this that you are supposed to be uncomfortable with. Especially mm-hmm. today in the world where film in general glorifies a lot of these things like violence and mental illness and this kind of stuff. Like when you look at look at Endgame, I mean that's the, that's the prime example of basically not taking any of this seriously. But Sucker Punch and Joker both do take it seriously. They may take it so seriously that when you see it, you are physically uncomfortable at certain points of it because you know it's wrong. But it's not wrong to see it in the film. It is wrong that it's still happening. And it is wrong that not enough is done about it. If that, that makes sense. That's the, that's the ongoing pattern with Zach's films. He doesn't bring up these topics flippantly. He, when, No matter what film we're watching, discussing, etc. Like, every time he brings up something serious, he makes sure to nail it on the head with the different, so like, aspects. Like, even if it's just one scene, you know, like... Like the like the Martha scene in BVS, or in this, like talking about how like she can't control her reality, so she's escaping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The he brings up these topics because he wants you to be uncomfortable. I won't pretend to be in his head, but it's just over and over we see this with like Watchmen, with all of his films. He wants you to be uncomfortable, so you think about it and you analyze your perspective. Because if you are uncomfortable and you walk out of that film and you're just like, ugh, I was so uncomfortable and like, whatever, that movie sucks. Then you obviously did not grasp the message. And that's the thing about art. That's the thing about like any form of art. It's telling you something. It's not always just throwing paint at the wall and hoping it sticks. It's teaching you. It's showing you a lesson. It's teaching you things. And... That's something that's always been so profound about Zach's work is that they're always teaching you something, no matter how fantastical or wild or even silly it can seem. He's making right. you think, and, and he's acknowledging something that's way too tough for society to feel comfortable acknowledging. And that's the problem that also nails on the head the problem of society. We're so, society's way too uncomfortable, even now knowing what we know in science and the medical field about mental illness, depression, etc., people are still not comfortable talking about it. And even back when Sucker Punch first came out, Zach was like waving a sign at this saying, look at this situation. This is topical. And that's the thing about his films like Sucker Punch or Watchmen. They're, they're timeless in the way that they're very topical for our generation. And what's going on in our society. I'm just going to connect on to that. Because Danny, who has a connection issue, uh, it's a reception issue. But, well, main point is she can't really speak right now. So she's sending a message. So I will read it out. Because she pretty much says a lot of what you just said. I believe all this with the Joker is mainly born from the blindness and a lack of knowledge of society regarding mental illness. People prefer to look away. People can't understand the difference between understanding the topic and relating with the character. She also agrees that uh, Zach always hides deeper topics behind his storylines. Yep, exactly. So, exactly. It's I mean, yeah, that. Like, I, I think that you both kind of hit the nail on that. 
this one. And the, you know, there's the whole situation, the whole like belief that ignorance is bliss, <clears throat> but really ignorance is not bliss. But society's going to continue looking at these issues with rose colored gla glasses. So artists like Zach are going to keep trying to make sure we look at it. At least some of us look at it and see what's wrong. Yeah. No. What I what I always say is you should yeah, look um, at these backing. films. And oh. what, yeah. Go on. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No. I just wanted to piggyback on the whole um, issue, especially like with the Martha scene. So, uh, 2016, there's a Martha scene continually mocked, right? And then you go to, yeah. like, 2019, and you have uh, another comic book movie that comes out that uses its own type of Martha scene. Um, instead, it's Bucky. Um, but there's that disconnect where, okay, well, the movie is serious, serious, serious all the time. It has a serious message, and then they add it to Endgame where it's like, oh, uh, let's do a PTSD scene, but then at the very end, we're going to do America's ass joke. It's like, the, I just feel like there's such a disconnect with that. It's, it's like, oh yeah, there's this, but don't take it too seriously. It's not that. Right, like, oh, deal. we're hinting at uh, some PS PTSD in this movie. Here's about 20 other jokes to layer on top of it, so you don't really get the of hey ptsd is a thing and it's important to talk about and people deal with it. uh here's an ass joke yeah no well, i think that we'll definitely have to that, do an that, episode that about that someday. What, sorry we'll definitely have to do it up an episode discussing that someday i don't yes, think please. i can be present here for discussing endgame <laughs> <laughs> no, nana you should sign me up you be the star, I Nana. don't think anybody would be ready to listen to that three-hour like, hour rant, so let's not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Nicole always laughs. Well, it's like, it's like Nicole always laughs, you know, but she sets off this trigger with me in Endgame, and I'm just like... Oh, nope. I, li I live for it. <laughs> but anyway. I'm similar with that. You should hear my boyfriend. He's sick of me. Oh my god! No, so, so the so sometime in the future, Amazon special episode: Meg and Nana ranting on Endgame. Just wait. Yes. <laughs> anyway, let's go back uh, to Sucker Punch. Now, um, before we move on from this topic, I just wanted to say, um, and I think that it kind of connects with what Cole said and uh, Meg and Danny. Uh, I think that. But the, as I said, the uncomfortable scenes, the thing about them is that they not only are supposed to make you feel uncomfortable, they are supposed to give you this feeling that you can't shake for days. Like you have to think about it and you have to look back and you have to keep telling yourself, oh my God, this is something, something that almost wakes you up from your sleep because you just feel like that's so not okay if that makes sense and I think that's really mm -hmm. something that Zach knows how to do and that's what makes his films so probably so controversial at one point but also memorable it's that's honestly what one of, it's honestly one of his gifts that he's able to shock the system that much and it's good because yeah. some people do realize later on that it's more profound. I mean, okay, when I first watched Sucker Punch, I don't know why I did this, but I watched Sucker Punch, Inception, and Black Swan back to back, no pausing. I maybe went to the bathroom. My, I was psychological thriller, like bled out. My brain was mush, you know. <laughs> so I had to watch, I had to go back to it a few few weeks later. I watched it with my dad, and my dad actually loves Sucker Punch. He was actually excited when I told him tonight's episode would be about Sucker Punch. Um, he really loves that movie. He loves the visuals, and he loves that it tackles such hard topics inside of like such a you know it's a nice film, but it's also gritty in its own way, and like. It's definitely, that's a, that's a trademark of most of Zach's films, is that you have to go back 
sometimes and rewatch to catch a few things. Like there, lately, I've found that I catch a lot of his stuff on the first go, but that's also part mm-hmm. of what makes rewatching his films so enjo- enjoyable because you'll notice things and be like, "Wow, he's a genius." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really is. You rewatch something and you pick up on something with every rewatch, no matter how many times you watch it. Well, I always do. Well, when, um, yeah. like we mentioned earlier with the costumes, something my dad mentioned that I completely forgot about. And you know, so he says to me, I remembered that film be- only because it had the girls with the Sailor Moon costumes. And I grew up on Sailor Moon, but for some reason, I never looked at Baby Doll's costume and put that together. And I was like, oh, geez, wow. And it made sense to me, though, because so many young women, If I don't know if Zach is a fan of Sailor Moon. Does he like, I mean, he does like anime. He's going to be making one. So, but the fact that I use Sailor Moon, which is such an empowering uh, sort of costume, it's like such an empowering character to young women. It's like, hmm, I wonder if that's part of the message or what have you. It's like little details that even though I've watched the movie three or four times in the past, I've never actually caught that until my dad mentioned it to me. Mm -hmm. Dear Zack Snyder, if you're listening to this podcast, do you like Sailor Moon? (laughs) Cole would like to know. (laughs) What Sailor Scout is your favorite? (laughs) I'm going to ask him. (laughs) <laughs> no, I do like the the talking about the costumes because I don't know if you guys have seen on Twitter, like in the last, I don't know, week or so, uh, people are complaining that Black Canary's outfit for Birds of Prey isn't like comic accurate with the fishnets and the bodysuit. And these women in Sucker Punch are wearing pretty much what Journey Smollett would be wearing if they had a comic accurate suit and people are bitching and complaining about the costumes in sucker punch yeah so, so it's like if you got I the feel accuracy like, you'd be bitching and complaining yeah exactly so it's like they're damned if they do and damned if they don't these costs like i don't know how many times you have to have that argument where it's like it does not matter what a female character is wearing she still can be empowering and powerful and badass she could be wearing literally absolutely nothing and she still would be i remember when sucker punch first came out it was shortly after vanessa hudgens who plays blondie had finished her time on high school musical and she said that her favorite part about the costume was how badass she felt and how it was so nice to go from playing a vulnerable high school character to some, a powerful woman who takes control of her universe and the costume made her feel that way. Yeah. And I Alfred can do that. Andy, by the way. Honestly, like... With- what did you say? You love Blondie? That I love her. And I was so sad when she dies. Yeah, she's awesome. Spoiler alert Same. if you haven't watched the movie. No, I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. spoiler. You shouldn't be listening to this if you haven't <laughs> watched it. I didn't know we were supposed to put spoiler alerts to this. Yeah, honestly, if you're listening <laughs> if you're listening to the show and you haven't watched it, please stop. So, um, I, earlier in our group chat, Meg, you were talking about Jenna Malone. You want to go off on that? Uh, yes. Uh, Jenna Malone, I'm starting a petition uh, she needs to be back, girl. The um, link will be up in the because, description below. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> just, like, I feel like the whole movie was, like, her audition for Batgirl. Like, every time I saw her, like, kicking someone's ass, I was just imagining her in wearing a cowl and having, like, a utility belt. I was like, oh, my God, she's literally Barbara Gordon. Yeah, there was a lot of rumor back when BVS came out and her little side yeah. character was that she was probably Barbara. And it'd be pretty cool if she was. I've loved her since I first was introduced to her in Sucker Punch and then again in the Hunger Games series. I fell in love with her as mm-hmm. Joanna Mason. And she's just such an amazing actress, honestly. If they made her Barbara Gordon, slap some red hair on her, I'm sold. Sign me up. Yeah, she's just, like, this whole movie, she's just so, like, witty and, like, ready to go. Like, she doesn't care if she dies trying to get her freedom. She wants it. And there's definitely something that Barbara Gordon, 
I feel like portrays a lot. Yes, exactly. Very selfless. Yeah. To bring in some Danny's opinions, she went uh, back to the what we were talking about just before with the costumes. Um, she says, I feel like all movies with powerful female, character, female characters are judged just as we are, judged by our exterior, like somehow it determines our inner richness, which pretty much I agrees love that. with everything I, I, you ladies said. I love that wording, though. It, huh? that, that I love that wording, inner richness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then she says, Jenna is awesome, another character sacrificed by you-know-what studio. Well, you know. <laughs> we won't be naming names, but uh, cough The cough. studio that shall not be named. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally say, thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> the group of Potterheads here. Anyway, that awkward moment when Potterheads make a podcast. Well, I'm going to be like Harry Potter and say, "Fuck you, Warner Brothers." I'm not scared of the name. I'll say <laughs> no. the fucking name. Go off, cat. This is. I don't it- give a fuck. It's Warner Brothers. Fuck them. I'm not going <laughs> to put say. Oh, I'm not going to make it seem like I'll give them the power and be afraid to say their name. Fuck that. <laughs> fuck Warner Brothers. <laughs> they're, they're- Denny goes, fuck yeah, cat. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I mean, I'm a Potter fan, you know, I, I love that you guys use the reference, but like I said, I'm going to be like Harry Potter and be like, no, say the name. The fear of the Cat name. is our Slytherin Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Fear of the name only increases fear in the thing itself. Exactly. Sorry, that was a, a they rant. Don't, they got no cracker on us. <laughs> <laughs> Even if they do, it doesn't really matter. Even if they do, I'm shitting on them every day on Twitter. You know what? Anyway, I got so. a message for them if they do. Release the Snyder Release cut. Release the Snyder Cut. Release the Snyder Cut. Exactly. Release the yeah, Snyder just Snyder let cut me right let now. me in your vaults for a little bit. Just let me snoop around in your vault. <laughs> I just want to talk. No, I'd be like, who do I need to have sex with to get it out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever needs to be done. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> 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 Yes, cat. Take one for the team, cat. Oh I'll take it for the team. I'll take it for everyone. Oh my god. Whatever needs to be done. Hey, if I need to suck somebody's <laughs> dick, I'll do it. <laughs> oh my god. And if I need to 69 someone, I'll do it. Oh my god. I'm crying. <laughs> if I need to take it from the back, I'll do it. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> I'm willing to do anything. Where's the, where's to get the, the if cut. we were ever monetized, we'll it wouldn't anything. be anymore. Where's the fa- Where's the fire hose when I need it? <laughs> yeah. there goes, there goes I'm blushing. <laughs> hey, maybe we can get like agent provocateur to like you know sponsor us. You know all the la- the lingerie company. Oh my Let's god! Let's just take our think, podcast to Pornhub. <laughs> I think I think that with Cat, we would even be successful with Patreon or something. Oh my god! We don't, we don't need True. to be monetized on YouTube. So getting <laughs> yeah. getting back to the topic at hand, let's reel it in, <laughs> ladies. Final word: release the Snyder Cut. Don't let, don't make me turn this podcast around. <laughs> okay, I'll <laughs> behave. I'll behave. Really? Oh no, you don't have to behave, Cat. <clears throat> we like you as you are. Oh, thank you. Same. And so our listeners does, do too. So now that we've gone completely off the rails, has any, <laughs> does anybody have any closing comments about the film? Um, uh, fuck everyone that doesn't like it because I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Meg was like Meg was and like And you know I'm the th- critics who don't like it, I they're already in the mindset of not wanting to like it. So you're right, fuck them because they're not going they're just they're refusing to actually pay attention to the movie. They have no rights to say, they have no opinion. They should not have an opinion. We're taking your rights away, critics. Because they're you know, refusing like- to understand. To refusing yep. to pay attention on purpose. That's how I see it as. What I, what I would have said, well, what I want to say um, regarding it, is like when we look at the sucker bunch, when you look at the ending, 
seemingly, seemingly in a way, it doesn't really end in the best way. I mean, we see Sweet Pea getting away, but obviously Baby Doll didn't, and neither did Rocket, Ember, or Blondie. But um, I felt like, in a way, all of them won in the end. I feel like the way that Baby Doll went for that lobotomy, she owned it. She went there, and she did the one thing that she could have done in a situation where she was, and that is she owned what was happening to her, and she showed them that no matter what, she's going to be coming up on top. And I think that was that was really important message of that film, and sort of an inspiration that maybe we should take for anything that we do in the future. And I think it could also be a little bit of inspiration for what we do as a movement, as in always keep going, always keep fighting. And no matter what they do or try to do to us, we can always come out on top. Very well said. Like, Dang, way to make my last words look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing hey, to follow those that. are my 3 a.m. thoughts, okay? <laughs> oh, you're right. No, we you're have all the weapons we need. I'm here. You're uh, right. We have all the weapons we need. We just need to fight. Sometimes uh, there are days where I, you know, I could be, I could be fighting harder instead of just sitting back and letting things or seeing things happen. And this movie kind of is a reminder to, to continue the fight and for what you believe in and in your everyday life and also fight for the Snyder Cut. It's a constant reminder of that. I think it also, uh, reminds you to like help others with their fight as well. Um, Mm -hmm. whether that be like a mental illness fight that they're going through, anything like that, uh, helping others find their freedom and whatever it is. Denny says the audience rule, not critics. They should stop trying to take over the industry. True. True. These critics, I don't know who gave them their credentials or what makes them a critic. I have no idea, but they, they need, first of all, they lack brains. They don't have any brain functioning. Sometimes the things that they come (laughs) up with, uh, regarding a movie like where are they getting the connection where are they it's like they, they see the director and they immediately want to like come up with the most ridiculous way to bash a movie or to downplay a movie like that pisses me off mm-hmm. well i have absolutely nothing to add you guys all said things very beautifully thank you thank so, you <laughs> i think so i think that wraps up this week's episode I think so too. I mean, there is one more thing. I just noticed that Denny's, uh, she said regarding the lobotomy scenes, I think we all have to deal with people that don't want us to think, react, or raise the voice uh, too loud. It's sick, but realistic metaphor of women's struggle. And I think that it's partially right. I do not, we do not really need to go into deeper conversation over this as we've pretty much talked about this before but yes it is it is a metaphor of silencing us so let's end the note in this podcast on we shall not be silenced never nope never be silenced and this is snyder's amazons signing off